So Michael, I wanted to thank you again for coming in today. I had a chance to review your resume and I was actually quite impressed. So you have a background in accounting and you've actually transitioned to doing more autonomous systems type work recently. Yeah. So there's one project in particular I'd be really interested in hearing about, which was using convolutional neural nets in self-driving cars. I was wondering if you wouldn't mind kind of taking me through a little bit of that project, some of the challenges that you faced, um, some of the methods that you used, and if there's anything that you would have liked to have done that you just didn't have a chance to yet. Sure. Um, so in that project, I was originally attempting to come up with a deep learning approach that was more robust than what we had done in the class um, around advanced lane finding. So in the project, we had used more classic computer vision techniques uh, where we used different color gradients, et cetera, to kind of go through and find where the lane lines likely were in the image. Then we had to do perspective transformations where we essentially got a bird's eye view of the road. All of this took quite a bit of computational power, so it wasn't really real time. I believe it was running at roughly three FPS or so, which doesn't really work in real world applications. You're not updating fast enough. So in this approach, I wanted to get something that truly could go at real speed, around 30 FPS or so, as well as being more robust than what I did before. The original one wasn't very good on curves, for instance. Mm -hmm. Once I got up to too big of a curve, uh, the algorithm just would stop working and run off the page essentially and think that the lines were going straight when they were really going curved. So um, along with gathering that training data then, uh, which I went out and essentially just drove around my car, you know, had my um, phone up and taking in video images and extracting those frames out from my training data, I then moved on to my network. And my network was built using um, a similar architecture to SegNet, which was a paper I read at the time. I'm probably going to diagram it out yeah, here. Yeah, could you show me that really quick? I'm not really familiar with that one. So SegNet's basic idea, it starts out like a normal convolutional neural network. Mm -hmm. And usually a convolutional neural network comes out with an um, input image coming in as your input, and then you have successive layers that are smaller convolutional layers. And a lot of times in um, another network, you might have like a fully connected layer at this point, but the difference with a fully convolutional neural network, which is what SegNet had in it, was that on the flip side, you come back with what are called deconvolutional layers that slowly get larger and have this semantic output where um, it you know, potentially is the same size as your image or you could resize it back up to that. But every single pixel in that output is actually a different class. In my case, it was whether you were the lane or not the lane. So in doing so then, I'm basically doing binary classification between the two. Mm -hmm. There's also applications where you have more classes, say a vehicle or pedestrian, et cetera. Um, in my case though, I was just wanting to improve on my lane finding algorithm. Um, so I just looked at the lane itself. Some of the other applications also look for just free space on the road, which I thought, you know, well, I don't really want my car to be driving on the opposite side of the road. So I really only want to know what my own lane is here. One of the um, challenges that I ran into first was uh, in actually getting this to fully work um, and train correctly because semantic um, segmentation networks actually also use a technique that are called skip layers. Now skip layers can very easily be used to essentially go from um, you know, skipping entire middle section of the network or they could also be used just to skip uh, between two, two layers or more layers, however many you want. Now this is important because when you've extracted some more advanced features, but you've also gone through max pooling layers, you're a lot of times losing information about where in the image a certain thing occurred. So if I'm trying to classify every pixel, it's important to have that information at the end and be able to draw that back. Um, now another thing that happens is when you perform back propagation, you need to make sure that the information is actually going all the way through. Because if you get a really deep network, back propagation can have what's called a vanishing gradient problem where you're doing so much of the uh, chain rule and multiplication going back that it starts diminishing that gradient and essentially you don't really feed any of the error to those earlier layers in a really deep network. And this helps fix that problem because you're actually skipping over, missing some of the multiplication in the middle and that back propagation signal continues all the way back to the front of the network. Hmm. Really interesting. Nice, thank you. Yeah, thanks.